before we talk about 3D printing, there's a, a few little concepts, a few little things that I want to talk to you about. First, it's important that we understand uh, the supply chain. Basically, how products get from raw materials all the way to the end customer. So products go traditionally through a certain number of steps. And so uh, they go through a certain number of, of intermediates. And uh, of course, today with, with the internet and electronic commerce and mobile commerce, this is transforming quite a bit. A lot of these steps are being eliminated in something that we call disintermediation. And so 3D printing is one more thing that is going to have an effect more and more in, the, in that, uh, I that aspect. If you remember, uh, this is the, uh, the uh, ETAC, right? The Emerging Technology Assessment Canvas. So I'm not gonna go through all of this uh, with you, but I do want to point out that as part of the assessment of, of the emerging technology that explanation or presentation that I'm giving you today, I did take the time to complete the ETAC and to look at to look at how I can use this tool to try to get a better understanding of the potential impact of and the potential opportunity of this uh, emerging technology. So that information is there in the presentation. I'm just not going to go and covering in the detail of it, as it will just be repetitive to what I'm going to say in, in my presentation. There has been many studies that have been done on uh, what are the uh, important emerging technologies of 2018-2019. This technology of 3D printing is one that very often comes in is identified as one of these technologies. As you know, in our course, we are looking at uh, one evaluation of emerging technologies, the one uh, presented by Gartner, where we focus it, we're focusing more into technologies that are more directly IT related. And so that's why 3D printing is not, is not in that list. What we're looking at now is uh, emerging technologies that have a significant or potentially a significant impact on business organizations in a more general fashion. Not strictly IT related. But as you see this list from uh, the Turban, so this is in a, a book on, uh, on new technologies or, or information technologies for, uh, for managers. Most of these technologies are very similar to the technologies that we talked about uh, in the, the Gartner list that we've been looking at. And of course, many of these are technology, are IT based, because of the, you know, the big potential that information technology does have to transform organizations. But not, they're not only limited to information technology. So 3D printing is one of these technologies that was identified, which of course has a technology component to it, meaning that you know, 3D printing is not possible without technology, but it's not strictly a technology uh, aspect as, as we will uh, be discussing. So this is another uh, list of uh, another study that was done. This was presented in the, in the MIT Sloan Management Review in 2018. And uh, here also you see these technologies, seven technologies that are remaking the world that are transforming the world that we're in. And so, you know, we have, of course, 3D printing has been identified as one of these. Others uh, are like robotics, machine learning, which is a component of AI that we've already talked about. Nanotechnologies, right? Nano, very, very small technologies. For example, that you could have sensors that are small enough that they could be injected in your blood and, and they could be used. Uh, as part of uh, biotechnologies or medical technologies. And that's something that possibly we'll have the time to talk about in, in a few weeks. 3D printing, again, here identified as, as one of the, the important technologies. Another study here, uh, also Goldman Sachs, uh, McKinsey, uh, Deloitte, uh, Gartner, all of these have identified 3D printing as a transformative uh, technology. So as a technology that has a significant impact 
or has the potential to have a significant impact on how businesses evolve in the future. So there seems to be a very large consensus of people saying that you know this is an emerging technology, a new emerging technology that is has the potential to transform organizations. So now uh, having you know had this little introduction, we can start t thinking about 3D printing and its uh, so the first thing that we have to keep in mind of 3D printing is that this is something that is also known under the name additive manufacturing. And so what we are doing here is we are taking a product, a material, which we are making uh, in a liquid form, and then we are laying this on an X, Z axis, X, Y axis. So just like when we are writing, for example, on paper, X, Y, two dimensional. And then we move up the device that is delivering this material. We move it up a tiny little bit, and then again, X and Y. So that is the basic way that these work. And so we're continuously adding material. We're adding and adding and adding and adding. And very, very slowly, we are building up an object. So that is the basic thing. So that's why talk, when we talk about 3D printing, if we want to be a little bit more technical, really what we should be talking about is additive manufacturing. So we are adding material, adding material. This is the opposite of, of how many businesses have been working in the past creating products in, in the process called machining that you might be familiar with, where we are doing subtractive manufacturing. We start with a block, let's say a block of metal, aluminum, and we gradually take away material until we have what we have left is the object that we wanted. Just like you know, uh, sculptures, like Michelangelo was taking a block of marble, right, or rock or stone, and carving out his object into this block of stone, revealing the work of art that he wanted to create. So that is subtractive manufacturing. So we start with a lot of material and we break it down until we get to the shape that we want. So here we're doing the exact opposite. We start with nothing and we are building up the object that we want. Now there's many different processes. This process here is called FDM, fusion deposition manufacturing. So really fusion, we are melting something, typically plastic. And we melt this plastic, we deposit it on an X, Y, and then we move up and then we deposit more. So that is FDM. The, this is the most common everyday use of 3D printers. I myself have 12 3D printers in my lab, and all of them except one are this type of process, FDM. The other one that I have is what's called SLA, so sintering laser uh, process. So here, this is a different process. I have a pool of resin, liquid resin, and I'm shooting a laser inside of this resin and where the laser focuses, it will solidify the resin. It will become solid. And so gradually, I am building more and more material by fusing this material with the laser beam inside of this resin. So this is a very, very highly precise process. It's a little messy because there's liquid. Uh, but it allows us to create very, very precise uh, prints. This is what a, a dentist used. If you go to a dentist's office today, they use 3D printers, this type of 3D printers, to make dentures or to make molds for dentures. Uh, also, a jewel maker, people who make jewelry, will make, use this to make a ring. They will make the, the model for a ring uh, very, very highly precise, and then they will, of course, melt it into silver or diamond or platinum or s uh, silver or the, the gold. But they will make the, the model, they will make it with this type of SLA printer. 
You could also use it to create resin uh, molds that you will use to be able to do casting as well. And there's another process also very popular, SLS, which you may have seen in the video. Here we have powder. We have uh, metal powder and we shoot a laser onto the powder to harden it, to melt it and so it hardens. And then we, we add a layer of powder and then we shoot the laser again. And we add a layer of powder and we shoot and we layer and shoot and layer and shoot and layer and shoot. And we build up a, a, 3D, a metal 3D object or a certain types of plastic as well using this process of SLS. Now these are typically very, very expensive printers, particularly when you get into titanium. Uh, titanium SLS uh, uh, printers are very popular, becoming more and more popular. They are very expensive. We're talking about hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars for these printers. But these allow you to 3D print very high quality parts in metals like titanium, which have, uh, you know, as I'm sure you know, has very particular characteristics for aerospace, for example, or for the military, or even for healthcare print, uh, bones and things like that, replacement bones. So really, this 3D, print, 3D printing right now has many, many different types of materials that are possible to use. We have all kinds of plastics and polymers that we can use. We have 3D printers that do ceramics. So I can print a vase, I can print an object in ceramics. Tiles, for example, imagine that I wanted to create a tile for something like the space shuttle. You know, it has ceram ceramic tiles for the heat shield that have, need to have a very, very precise, very specific shape. So that's something that I could do with a ceramic 3D printer. A cement 3D printer, very, very large size 3D printers that use cement and so they can print a house, they can print a building. This is, can be very interesting for certain types of applications. Of course, uh, very popular, uh, that one that people like to talk about is food, print 3D printers. So a food paste, for example, chocolate. Uh, so you could use, create a 3D printer that will print your face on the, uh, on the cake, or that will print uh, a, a shape in the, in sugar paste, for example. So if I have a food 3D printer. The most common use of these 3D printers is to print pizza. So I can 3D print pizza. So I'm not sure how good the pizza is, but it's a certainly has, it's something that people are looking at. Biological materials, so I could print a, 3D print a liver, 3D print a heart, 3D print a brain, maybe, that a lot of uh, people might be useful uh, to the 3D print a brain. And finally, of course, all kinds of different material, metals that I talked about uh, already. So this is basically uh, 3D printing. So if we compare additive manufacturing with subtractive manufacturing, so remember like machining that I mentioned before, there's many different possibilities uh, that we can think of. Uh, reducing the production cost, reducing the production time, uh, the ability to create certain shapes that cannot be done with subtractive <coughs> manufacturing. Remember that if you look at a, a machine, machining is done using a tool, and this tool has certain paths, certain paths to be able to travel to make certain shapes. And so that's not, it's not possible to move in every possible way, even with very advanced machining tools. There are certain shapes that are just not, cannot just be made uh, by doing that. But with 3D printing, there's always a way to be able to do it. Because it's really, I, I can print, you know, just out of thin air, basically. And then if I need to have, if, like in plastic 3D printing, I can also add temporary support to be able to build on top of it, and this temporary support can easily be removed later. Or in certain types of, of support material will uh, dissolve in water. So I can print with the support material, then I, I put it in water, the support material will dissolve. So I'll be able to make certain shapes with 3D printing that just cannot be made in any other ways. And you see an example here of the original shape that was machined 
and a new shape that was 3D printed that has the same function and that has the same strength for the purpose that it serves. However, this uh, modified part is much, much lighter and also uses a lot less metal. So this means that you know it has a lot of benefits. Imagine from a manufacturing point of view, if I can make more parts with less <coughs> materials, I have a competitive advantage. I have an efficiency gain. But also, for certain applications, and we can think of uh, aeronautics as a very good uh, example. If I can make a part that has the same strength, but that has half the <coughs> weight, this means that I can make a lighter plane. So I can carry more passengers or more cargo or use less fuel to achieve the same goal. So this has tremendous implications for certain industry. Any industry where weight is an issue is going to benefit from this type of manufacturing. Another very interesting one also is the environmental aspect. Because I'm using less resources, I'm wasting less. And this is much better for the environment, obviously. But also distribution, geographic distribution, just-in-time manufacturing. See here, with 3D printing, I don't need to ship products to all over the world. I can print them where they're needed. So basically, I can ship the file electronically to a 3D printer. So let's say, for example, that uh, I work for uh, airline, Air India, and there's a part that is needed to uh, repair an airplane. And I don't have this part in stock in my, in my hangar. So I need to order this part from, let's say, Boeing in Seattle. So this means that my plane will be sitting on the ground for many days until the part arrives, then I can install it. Or the other option, of course, is to have spare parts in stock. But this will be very, very expensive. I need to have a lot of spare parts because I don't know what's going to break. Here, I just need to contact Boeing by telephone or even just by email. And I say, I need part XYZ243. XYZ so they will send it to my printer, and it will print right away. They, have, they know which airplane it's for. They know what model. It, they will print the part. And a few hours later, I will have the part uh, in my hands. I'll be able to go and install it very, very quickly. And I don't need to have any stock. I don't need to have any spare parts. So we can think of this uh, for the automotive industry, for example. Parts, plastic parts that break often, bumpers or even uh, shells for doors or, or, or body parts, things like that, could very easily be 3D printed. So instead of having a huge uh, distribution center and a huge warehouse to have all these parts, and then having to have all these you know, cars and trucks that go around shipping all these parts and delivering all these parts, with 3D printing, I can just print on demand. I can just, create, I can just manufacture the part right where it is being used. I can think of the military, for example, the military out in the field that are in the middle of a, of a conflict, of a war of some kind, or doing like, like the military here in Canada these days, helping people who are you know, having problems with the flood going on. I can, they can have a 3D printer. They have 3D printers. I don't know in Canada, but certainly the US Marine Corps has 3D printers on, in the field. So they can repair equipment and they can even create specialized parts for particularly particular events that they have. And somebody has an idea of how they can create a new part, they can draw it on the computer and they can print it right in the middle of a combat zone. So these are all different uh, possibilities. And finally, here when we talk about Internet of Things and Industry 4.0, new indust industrial models, no new ways of doing business, also, 3D printing, uh, additive manufacturing has a lot of possibilities for that. So, is 3D printing a new technology? Many people seem to think that it is, but actually it's not a new technology. The original the idea is from the 80s. And even before that, if you look at the uh, Star Trek, 
uh, TV show, they talk about something called the replicator. The replicator is basically the idea of the 3D printer. <coughs> but really, the first 3D printers go back to the early 80s, mid 80s, uh, where there's a, a, pat a US patent that, was, uh, that came out on 3D printing, and you see here the, this original patent. Uh, you just do a Google patent search and you will find it. But what has changed is that because this is actually a very old patent, relatively old patent, in the mid-2000, about 2005 or 2007, uh, around there, the patent expired. And so now uh, 3D printing has entered the public domain. So since then, there's a guy who came up with a RepRap project, or a self-replicating 3D printer. So basically a 3D printer that you can use to print 3D printers. So you print your own printers. So that has meant that the price of printers have, has significantly gone down with the ex expiration of the 3D printing patents, the early patents. And more and more players have arrived into this marketplace. <coughs> And there's even people like me, for example, who build and design and build their own 3D printers. So now you can get a 3D printer for, I've seen some as low as $100. But a decent popular 3D printer is about $250, $250 $300. My 3D, 3D printers that I have in my lab go anywhere from about $200 to about $5,000. So of course the difference will be the speed, will be the precision, will be the type of materials that you can use, etc. But still it's the idea that it's become very, very inexpensive now, particularly since the RepRap project. Another thing also that has contributed to that is STEM education. So the fact that science, technology, education, art, and math are being taught more and more in schools uh, it's, it's particularly true in certain countries where we've seen many advancements in that, in the US, in Canada, but so many engineering schools that are all over the place. And this is because governments in places like India have recognized that engineering is very important to the future of society. We need more engineers. So we are starting to teach people at a very young age about science and technology and trying to get them interested in science and technology. In Canada, this is particularly true with young boys. It's very difficult to keep young boys interested in school. Science and technology and engineering is something that tends to interest them very much. So 3D printers is a tool that can be used in STEM education. It's a tool that can be used to help interest young Canadians or young people in science and technology and get the impression that they're learning without really learning. They're actually doing you know, practical applications using 3D printers. And in doing these, 3D, these applications, they're learning. Because they have to apply, they have to know mathematics, they have to know 3D, they have to know design, they have to know engineering. But they're doing it in a way that is more fun. So it doesn't feel like they're learning. It's a lot less painful. A lot less painful than you know, the pain that you guys are going through right now listening to this lecture. If you're actually doing stuff and playing with toys, 3D printers, it makes the whole learning experience a lot more enjoyable. So uh, there's also something called the, the DIY movement, the do-it-yourself movement, that has become very, very popular. So a lot of people now like to do things themselves. And so now that 3D people can have a 3D printer in their house, well, you can design and that people know how to do use CAD software. And there's even some really, really simple, easy to use CAD software. People can create their own objects. And maybe they can create a larger object that includes a smaller 3D printed component as part of that. Uh, then there's Make Magazine. That's a very popular magazine that's been out in the, for a few years now that has uh, also uh, made this very popular. And, and Make Magazine has launched a series of international events called Maker Fair. And there's thousands and hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people all over the world who go to these Maker Fairs and who, among many things, learn about the, the do-it-yourself movement 
and at the same time learn about 3D printers. There's also something called Fab Labs, fabrication laboratories that are being created all over the world. And these, like maker spaces and hacker spaces, are places where people can go and can get access to this technology if they don't have it at home, or perhaps have access to technology and knowledge that they wouldn't necessarily have access to uh, from home. So when we look at 3D printing, also one thing that we can see is that the number of 3D printing patents or 3D printing related patents has absolutely exploded. You see here on this graph, whereas you know, in 2004, there were only 40 new patents for 3D printing related technologies. In 2012, 345, but now 2013, 14, 15, you see how this slope is just going sky high, it's going straight up. So in 2016, for example, we had 7,671 3D printing related patents. So you see that there's a lot more products and there's a lot more things relating to 3D technologies that are happening. So a lot of people are working on this. A lot of people are interested uh, in this. So this is a really, really good sign. Also, the 3D printing market has absolutely exploded. So we see here some, some examples of the 3D printing you know, businesses. And you look at the size, you look at you know, how these, these arrows are heading up. And here we're in billions of US dollars. So really the market right now, the forecast, right, is going from about 10 billion to in excess of 30 billion uh, dollars, US dollars per year for the 3D printing uh, market. So this is absolutely, uh, totally exploded. Here what we're looking at is the uh, hype cycle. So if you remember from previous discussions that we've had, the hype cycle helps us to understand where is this emerging technology in its evolution. And so we obviously, you know, the, when the innovation trigger is just starting, then we get into the initially into the peak of inflated expectations. So, you know, people expect that 3D printing will be doing a lot for them. And then finally they're disillusioned for a while. And so their, you know, the hopes, the prospects of a bright future have gone down. But then slowly we get, we come to enlightenment and then we reach productivity. So we get to a point where, you know, people are actually applying this and, and in a useful you know, business applications. And so some of the 3D printing uh, services have already reached this plateau of productivity. So these are real tangible things, like for example, the 3D printing service bureaus. So these are places where you can go, uh, locations that you can go, and where you will get access to 3D printers. You can just even send them your files electronically and they will print it for you and they, they will ship you the final product. And there's you know, many of them here in Montreal. There's one just uh, Croix de Lézard that is just actually uh, about two blocks from here uh, that do this. They're relatively small, but there's some also that are getting bigger and bigger. There's one called uh, Fab Labs Inc which is uh, near the Jacques Cartier Bridge, not too far from here, that they, they're a professional grade uh, print shop. So they will basically create anything for you. And they have the you know, very fancy, very expensive uh, 3D printer and 3D printing capability. Now, so there's some new technologies that I'm, uh, hopefully if I have time, I'll talk about that later. Uh, but 4D, print, 4D printing, so remember, we'll be talking about 3D, X, Y, Z. And of course, the fourth dimension is perhaps time. So prints that evolve over time, but also over other dimensions as well, could be other dimensions as well, like space. Um, 4D, print, 4D printing, there's a lot of hope for the future for 4D printing. But that's only, as you can see, in the early phases of the uh, hype cycle. So there's still a lot of hype about that it still hasn't reached a, a level of maturity. Others like 3D printing for medical devices or human tissues or bio uh, printing, 
Uh, there's, that's actually in a disillusioned phase. People had a lot of hope early on for that. Now people are a little bit disillusioned because, of course, you know, it's a lot more complicated uh, than many people might have thought. But if you, again, if we look at, you know, the Gartner hype curve, it, a hype cycle, it's telling us that that's okay. Right? That's okay because, you know, people are still working on it. And once we've gotten to the, bo the bottom of this, uh, this disillusionment uh, cycle, then we're actually going to start to find actual practical applications. And there's a lot of hope for the future in that aspect. So now we're going to talk a little bit about how this is going to affect businesses, in particular business models, or how businesses function. So uh, there is this idea of uh, the shift that I alluded to before. So we're moving from the idea of, in the past, we would design for manufacturing. So engineers, when they are thinking of a new product, are going to design the product in a way that it will make it easy to manufacture, or that will make it feasible to manufacture. Engineers, which is different than designers, right? designers they, they create the ideal object. Engineers will create an object that can actually be manufactured. And well, here we don't have to worry about that aspect so much as, uh, anymore because now we can actually manufacture for the design. So we can create shapes that, don't, that are not restricted by the limitations of subtractive manufacturing, for example. Also, it allows us, to, as you know, in some of the examples I mentioned before, to cut inventory because now I don't have to have a large inventory of parts. When I need a part, I print it. Uh, and this, so this will affect the inventory, it will affect production costs, it will affect the manufacturing costs, being able to transform uh, how I do things, and this will definitely uh, then have an impact, a financial impact on businesses. It costs a lot of money to have a large inventory of parts you know, being there available uh, for me. It will all allows you also to uh, transform uh, your value proposition to even create new value propositions. So transforming your relationship with your customers. And it's referred often as a disruptive technology. So it really a cry, uh, allows you to create new types of business models. And one that is often comes up is the idea of mass customization. So imagine uh, Adidas. Adidas shoe company, they actually, now they 3D print shoes. So you basically can have your, sh your foot scanned and they will print the perfect shoe for your foot. And so anything, any product now can be completely customized specifically to, uh, to my needs. And this of course is the 3D printing is one of the elements that facilitate this capability of, of this hyper-customization now. So in 3D printing, we're really moving to what's called the agile production capability. So we're really transforming how we make products to be a lot more agile, to be a lot more flexible, to be able to adapt very, very quickly. So typically today, when you use 3D printing as part of your your design process, your design, your new production, you're gonna create an idea. You're gonna think of something. And then you will prototype it, on the, but you, you will 3D design it. So you're going to draw it on the computer using computer-assisted design software. And then you will print it right away. So you send it to the 3D printer. And maybe sometimes it will take three, four, three, four tries. So typically me. So I'm using, uh, right now, I actually am working on a project. I'm designing a new 3D printer. And f for my 3D printer, I need customized parts because it's a new, completely new design. So I create the part and I, I, I draw it. So I think in my head what it is that I want to do. Then I draw it on the computer. Then I print it. Now I very, very rarely get it right the first time. Typically, I will print three or four before I get it exactly the way I want it. So after three or four prints, then I know I have exactly the part. It fits exactly where I want to use it, etc. 
And then once I finalize my design by doing this trial and error, basically, then I will take these parts that I 3D printed, and then I will mass produce them. So in many different ways, perhaps mold injection. And then, of course, I will customize, I will commercialize my, my 3D printer. So this is a completely different way. Before, when I wanted to test a part, I would have to, you know, there would be a lot involved in tooling and machining costs to be able to make a, my initial prototype. But now, with 3D printing, it makes it very, very easy. Typical example for me is I will have an idea in the shower, because that's where I get a lot of my best ideas. It's in the shower in the morning. So I have an idea in the shower, and I'm actually using it by lunchtime. Because I will get the idea in the shower. After the shower, I have breakfast, have some coffee. Then I will do a first design, and I will send it to the printer. Two, three hours later, I have it. I can use it. I can use this browser. Maybe I'll take a couple tries before I get it just the way I want. And by the end of the day, I'll have it. So I can make a, maybe a part for a bicycle part or something. I can do that very, very quick. So that is what we refer to as the agile production. How I can become a lot more uh, agile. And of course, 3D printing has many different impacts on the customers to moving from a more individualized model, from a mass market model, on financial uh, uh, models of the organization, because I'm, I, I'm moving for away from high fixed costs and low variable costs to low fixed costs and high variable costs, which is much better for uh, businesses to, uh, to have more variable costs than fixed costs. It creates a lot of capabilities, uh, being able to manage my supply, supply chain right from the raw materials, and then being able to move away from mass production to on-demand production, uh, as I've talked about before. So this is one example on, of one industry, the uh, eyewear 3D printing in this, uh, industry. So this is making glasses. And as you know, many glasses are you know, made out of different types of plastics or polymers, or in some cases, metals. And uh, one important aspect of glasses is customization. So there's many, many opportunities for customization, or even uh, for low cost the production of glasses, or even production of glasses for specialized markets. So we can think of uh, for example, a, a zone where there was a hurricane, maybe, or, a, or some kind of natural disaster where we very quickly need to be able to produce glasses. 3D printing is, uh, has a lot of opportunities for that. Right now, it's very easy to print uh, the, 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 the parts of the, the glasses themselves. But also now, we're uh, starting to work. There's many prototypes of uh, lenses itself, the lens is being uh, 3D printed as well. So that's a, lot, a little bit more complex, of course, because of the optical characteristics. But still, that is something that is, uh, that is becoming more and more of a reality. So the eyewear industry is projected to hit 3.4, right? So 3,100 and what's in US million dollars. So basically 3.4 billion dollar industry by 2028. So this is a major, major, major business. This is just in one industry, if you imagine. 3D printing also impacts, so we talked about the business model, but it also impacts the supply chain. So in supply chain, keeping in mind that it's, you know, the adoption rate of uh, 3D printing is uh, increasing very si significantly, and it has a lot of potential uh, growth for the, the next few years. Of course, it's not, you know, as used uh, as much as we would hope today, but you can see that the trend is that this is uh, very much increasing. So how we can you know, transform uh, our organizational supply chains uh, with that. So there's many, many different ways that it will impact. 3D printing will impact the supply chain, and I'm not going to go through all of them. As you see, this is based on a, a search of in the literature on this, and I've identified many, many potential ones, but I want to focus on just a couple. Low barriers to entry. To, uh, so this is uh, the fact that if I'm launching a new business, one of the elements that make it more difficult for me to be successful 
is the fact that you know in order to set up my new business, maybe I need to set up a lot of inventory and parts, and there's a lot of cost to, to design and create and test new products. So as we saw already with 3D printing, this is totally transformed, becoming a lot more agile. So this is a tremendous opportunity for our, in our organizations. Uh, also the savings, the material savings, uh, the, uh, how it allows me to optimize my supply chain. However, there's a certain number of challenges and certainly the biggest one is the cost. 3D printers that print metal are still hundreds of thousands of dollars. Good quality 3D printers, even just for simple plastic applications, uh, unless you want to do really, really small sizes, we're talking really about you know, the, the cheapest one that I have, which, which prints about th uh, 30 centimeters by 30 centimeters by 30 centimeters. So that's not very, very big. This one is a $5,000 printer. I built one with one of my colleagues, Francois, that's a printer that does 1.3 meter by 1.3 meter by 1.3 meter. And this is a $20,000 printer. This is a home built printer for about $20,000. If I go into commercial printers, one meter by one meter by one meter is about a 50 to 60 US, uh, thousands of dollars, US. So this is still very, very expensive. And metal printers and specialty printers are easily into the you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, and then of course there's the material that can be very, very expensive. And then the other issue is the issue of speed. So the 3D printer, like the one that I have, if I wanted to print the, you know, something about the size of a water bottle, this, uh, this would be about a 10 to 12 hour print. So if I want to optimize my supply chain, I need to be able to print, uh, you know, 20 of these bottles in one hour not one every 10 hours. But of course, if you remember from previous discussions that we had, Moore's Law teaches us that it'll get cheaper and cheaper and it will get faster and faster. And I think we could have Moore's Law applied to, the equivalent of Moore's Law applied to 3D printing. 3D printers are getting cheaper and cheaper and they're getting faster and faster. So right now this is a challenge, but this is something that you know, a lot of people are working on this aspect. Another challenge is the paradigm shift that, it, that uh, for design of products, we need to rethink how we design products, we need to rethink how we do products. There's a lot of issues as well with what we call uh, mechanical and thermal properties. So plastic you know, products may not resist very well to heat, so that can definitely be a, a challenge. And finally, I want to mention the one of IP, intellectual property. Because, of course, if it's very easy to either 3D scan or to just draw a software with 3D design software and print it, well, how can I create a business model around you know, making products that people can basically make themselves? And so when 3D printers, as the price goes down, this more and more people will have access to this technology, meaning that more and more people will be able to just print their own stuff instead of buying it. So although this can be very, very useful if I'm you know, in, the, uh, in a, a very far away region of Africa and I need to create a, a car park, I need to print a car park because I need to fix my Jeep because I'm stuck in the middle of nowhere, that can be great. But if my business model is to sell parts, well, I've got a big problem. You know, that's definitely going to be a, a challenge for uh, the supply chain uh, industry. So, um, so many examples of uh, different things that we can do, different types of parts that we can do. Uh, so can some consumer parts, we can make some prototypes. Uh, wearable products, so uh, smart products. And you know, we've talked about even uh, many times here, we talked about you know, intelligent apps, intelligent products, artificial intelligence, et cetera. Well, so I can create now, I can 3D print some, in, some products in which I'm going to incorporate uh, some intelligence through chips or, uh, or uh, field gate processors or et cetera, programmable uh, devices, et cetera. Uh, for the automotive industry, uh, customized parts, also vintage parts. 
I met a guy in, uh, in Sweden. His business was uh, Saab. He sold Saab parts for old Saab for collectors. And so he basically had scanned or had designed or had gotten the designs for thousands of obsolete car parts from the Saab car company. And so he has the ability to print these parts. So he sells old Saab parts for uh, customers. So that's uh, totally new. For in healthcare, many applications, orthopedics, prosthetics. One very interesting application is uh, replacement limbs. There's actually an open source sort of project right now going on in many countries where people have created open source, free, available uh, uh, limbs. So for people, let's say they get their arm cut off and they're in, you know, in a little village in the middle of nowhere and they don't have any money, well, they can, if they have access to a 3D printer, they can print these uh, new replacement limbs. So there's some really interesting stuff going on uh, in that industry. Um, in the military, so to, uh, I talked about before already, uh, for dental labs, all kinds of dental products, uh, for retail, for inventory, in aerospace, of course, for creating lightweight parts, a lot of different opportunities there. Many opportunities in jewelry, and of course in manufacturing, uh, you know, doing prototyping, doing jigs to set up uh, uh, tooling for your factories, for parts, for even you know, components of larger products. So many, many different opportunities for that. There was a survey that was done, uh, 500 companies by 3D Hubs, in which they identified that the two major uses today in companies that were actually using 3D printing is prototyping and additive, additive uh, manufacturing. So really, prototyping is, uh, is uh, a big uh, application. In most of the companies that are using 3D printing right now, it's the number one application is prototyping. So there's a few examples I talked about before. So Adidas are actually using 3D printing to create shoes. And there's some examples, you might have seen these before. These are 3D printed soles. And so the, the beauty of these soles is that they're able to print them in a way that they use a minimal amount of, of product that makes them extremely light. It's very, very, very lightweight soles. So the, the only way that this can be done is through uh, 3D printing. This is a part for a seat for an airplane. And as you can see, this is a 3D printed uh, part of a seat of the airplane, which is 54% less uh, weight than the normal seat. So this means thousands of, of kilograms that are saved. If you look at the number of seats in one airplane, right? This is, we're talking about thousands of kilograms that are saved. So this basically would allow you to have more fuel, or to have more cargo, or to have uh, more passengers. This is a tire, a prototype for a new type of tire. And if you notice, there is no air in this tire. This is a puncture-proof tire. And if I shoot at it with a gun in a military application, this would get shot at. You could see many of the bullets would just go straight through. So this, would, this, would, this is very, very interesting for off-road applications or rural uh, type of applications, farming equipment, etc. So that's only possible through uh, 3D printing. Many, many different medical uses. I talked already about uh, glasses, eyewear, but for specialized uh, equipment, you see a wheelchair here that was custom designed for a specific individual, or even bone replacement. Somebody got shot in the face and his, his uh, he needed a new, uh, basically new face bones. So they, these can be uh, 3D printed as well. So many, many different applications in healthcare. I've talked before about the fact that this is very useful for prototyping and also has a potential use for manufacturing. But the reality is most of the time when we're manufacturing either with metal or with steel or with plastics, we will not use uh, machining or additive manufacturing for large production runs. 
we have other techniques in which we use molds, like for plastic, it's something called injection molding. And uh, what, we, what we know is that actually the break-even point for injection molding versus additive manufacturing is about 500 units. So if I want to make something, my, I want to make a part, if I want to make more than 500 of these, it's better to go with injection molding. Injection molding is very expensive at the beginning because I need to make the mold and that's actually very, very complex. But once the mold is cost, then it basically costs nothing to make more parts or very, very inexpensive, just the price of the plastic. And then, of course, it can be very, very, very fast to do that. It's the same for metal as well. If I'm making a metal part, if I'm making a large number, then I will, it'd be a lot cheaper to do it uh, creating a mold. So, uh, so this, is, uh, this is what we're looking at here. Is, what is actually the break even? And for plastic, it's about 500 years. So uh, the challenges for management of this, top challenges are the top cost that I talked about, the manufacturing costs, post-processing requirement, meaning that after the, thing, the object is printed, something needs to be done to it to finalize the process. So for example, if we have to use support, or if we do it using powder for metals, we have to remove all the excess powder. We have to clean the part to make it ready. That requires a new process that we don't have. There's also the, the, you know, the amount of material that some of these materials are limited availability. The fact that there's really a lot of issues with the business case. There's no clear business case on how this, we can justify this to our organization. There's a, a, lot, a lack of talent. There's not a lot of people who know how to use Additive manufacturing, not, not a lot of engineers that are trained in these new techniques. It makes it difficult to be efficient on how we use it. There's some difficulties in how we integrate this into organizations. And then many organizations, manufacturing organizations, just don't want to take any risk. They have you know, processes, manufacturing processes, that we've, we've been using pretty much for the last 150 years. And people are very comfortable with those processes. So why change? So that is actually a big uh, management point of view, a challenge uh, for organizations. Another challenge is the idea of open innovation. We have to understand that we have an opportunity here to rethink how we work, to rethink how organizations function. See, the typical traditional model is that companies would invest a lot of money in research and development to create a product. And then they would take this product, they would get a patent on this product, and then they would have the exclusive right to make this product for 20 years, maybe even sometimes more, in which, or they would, and then they would manufacture this product, or maybe give a license to a, other manufacturers, and then they would get royalties on it. This is sort of the traditional model. This is a good model, but the reality of today has changed. And now, pretty much everyone has the ability to become an inventor and to create new products. As well, there's, there's uh, difficulties with uh, limited resources, limited raw materials, environmental issues, etc. And also the, the evolution of how people think of themselves as a different type of consumers that we have become, that we are becoming. So uh, this creates a lot of pressures on organizations and a lot of pressure on the traditional innovation way of doing things. So now many organizations, they work with others when they innovate. They work with, even sometimes with competitors or with people in the public. And so then this is this idea of open innovation. So rather than having closed innovation where you're doing everything on your own inside of your own organization and trying to keep everything secret, why not just transform this and just open the whole thing up? And so that you're sharing you, the skills and the resources and the knowledge with other people, with other organizations. And so uh, giving people the ability to contribute to the innovation process and to create value and add value and, and then, of course, in a way, benefit from this value that they're creating. 
So instead of closing the innovation, we're opening up the innovation and we're allowing people to contribute. So this is a very interesting opportunity, right? But at the same time, it's also a big challenge for many of the reasons that I talked about before, but you know, the, how people, uh, how organizations may be uh, you know, averse to change and uh, uh, may not really like to change how they've, they're, they're working. But you know, some organizations have started to do this. Michelin Tire Company, for example, are doing this. Uh, Renault, uh, many different companies. Uh, very, and they're seeing some interesting ideas and interesting products emerge. And we're going to see some new products, some electric cars, for example, from Renault that have uh, open innovation platforms. So that they are really selling not on, they're not just selling a, going to be selling a car, but they're going to be selling a concept, and then people can come and, and add, create new versions or updates or accessories and that work with this open platform. So in the end, the idea is that this would create a lot more value. And this would even create totally new markets that we haven't even thought of when we originally designed the product. So that is this idea and this model that was proposed by the Professor Chesborough here that we see. And that was developed to try to help us to understand how this can work. So really, it's more of a, of a Swiss cheese type of innovation. So we're poking a whole bunch of holes in our model. And we're trying to see where this is going to take us. And licensing our technology rather than, than uh, keeping it uh, for ourselves. So a few recommendations for you guys as future managers. Uh, because of course 3D printing is, you know, hasn't completely reached the, pr the, the point where the cost and the speed and the scalability make it a very in, uh, interesting solution. But it's, it's definitely the right thing to use right now for prototyping. So if you're developing new products, testing new products, or prototyping new products, that's where uh, 3D printing is really big right now. However, you know, as there's new type of materials that arrive, as the costs continue to go down, as the, the, the speed inc continuously increases, it's definitely something that you, you need to keep an eye out for. As students, this is something that you should probably invest a little bit of time. All of you as engineers, this is something that should be on your radar. This is something that you should, need, you should know about. Because, you know, in the next few years, everyone's going to be using this. So you should really know about it. And of course, as future managers, it's really something that you need to keep aware of. Now, uh, everything I said was all the fine and dandy and really nice and cute and, and you know, warm, happy bunnies, Easter and everything. But the reality, of course, that there's, there are some ethical issues that we need to keep aware of. And there are some corporate social responsibility issues. And the big one is, of course, plastic. Because 3D printing is not reducing in any way the amount of plastic that we're using. And plastic is a really, really big problem. Uh, you know, as an example, I always, you might notice when I come to class, I always have my own water bottle. And today I forgot my water bottle. I, heard, I had to buy a plastic water bottle. And these are great, they're really convenient. But these suck. These are a disaster for the environment. We need to reduce the amount of plastic that we use. And 3D printing is definitely not reducing plastic, at least not right now. The thing is, of course, there are some people working on 3D printers that use recycled plastic. So that you can, this is what we're seeing here. This is a company from the Netherlands that have called Precious Plastic. And they have created an open source platform so that allows us to shred. So this is the shredder over here, right, in the middle here. This is a plastic shredder. So you put all your plastic bottles, for example, in the shredder, and you get plastic pellets. And then using these plastic pellets, you can either use this device here, which is an injection molding device. So you create a mold out of epoxy. Uh, uh, you make a 3D prototype, and then you create a mold from that prototype. And then you melt plastic pellets in here and you push, so you create pressure and you push <coughs> the plastic inside of the mold and you create an object. 
or you put the, the plastic pellets on this thing that we have here on the left, which is an extruder, and it will create, it will melt the plastic and it will create filament that will then can be used inside of a 3D printer. And you crush it here, you separate the different types of plastic and you crush it here, and now you can use this for a 3D printer. Now you can use this to 3D print. That is very, very interesting. That has tremendous potential. But right now, this is only experimental. This is not really into production. Then there's a lot of issues relating to intellectual property, because of course, you know, with 3D printing, I see something that I like, I don't have to buy it. I can just draw it, I can print it. There's even something called a 3D scanner, or even with pictures, photogrammetry, I can actually take pictures of an object. If I have enough pictures, I can reconstitute a, three, reconstitute a 3D object from the photo, photographs. So there's a lot of issues relating to that. Who owns the rest? So what's the future? Well, there is this one thing called Fab City, the idea of creating new types of cities, connected cities, that are locally productive, so that have the our own local production ability, right? So shifting from you know the current models that we have now of product in garbage out, and by creating a return of manufacturing in the cities themselves, rather than creating a product in in this case I think it's Barcelona, creating a product in Barcelona and then having it made in China then have it shipped by container back to Barcelona or shipped over to us, now we can actually create it, manufacture it locally. So we, we, you know, this is a, we can design things, we can go in these places that I talked about, these fab labs, these baker spaces, where you could design your own product and you can print it yourself. You can even, you know, we have something called planned obsolescence of products easily very quickly become obsolete or just stop working and it's too expensive to fix them and you can't even get the parts to fix them. Well now, with, with this type of technology, you have that capability, right? You can actually create the part that you need. So this is it. The future is this idea, or one of the possible futures is this idea of what, they, what we call the fab city. The, the locally productive city, the city where we now have capabilities that we used to have before. Then there's this other idea here for the future, which is the 4D printing. I mentioned this earlier. The idea that you know, now time will, will influence products or they'll be adding this four dimension. So imagine that we could have products that would self-assemble. So the typical example here is I have a, a, a part that I need to ship up to the space shuttle, to the space station in orbit. And of course, you know, shooting stuff into orbit is very, very expensive. But if I could ship it flat, and when it arrives there, then it will self-assemble. That would be amazing. Uh, so that is this idea of, of products that evolve over time. This is an example of 4D printing. So the object was printed as a, a strand of plastic, and then it's self-assembled. In this case, it's uh, forming the, le the words uh, to the MIT, the school. So there's some very interesting things going on, and this is one of these technologies that, that uh, people need to have on their radar. So 4D technology. So that is probably, that is one of the possible futures of uh, of where uh, 3D printing is going to.